Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table. We discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Daryl Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center at Dallas Theological Seminary. And my guest today is Wesley Hill, who is uh, well known. He's very young, but he's well known for uh, for the writing that he's done related to New Testament studies. And our topic today is a combination of things that you might think maybe don't entirely belong together. Uh, on the one hand, uh, dealing with issues related to same-sex uh, attraction challenges in the church on the one hand, and dealing with spiritual friendship issues on the other. And, and we're going to talk about how these two topics kind of intertwine. Uh, Wes has written two books, Washed and Waiting, Reflections on Christian Faithfulness and Homosexuality for Zondervan, and then he's recently done a work called Spiritual Friendship. And Wes, why don't you tell people uh, what you do in your kind of educational background for doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Daryl, first of all, thank you for having me on the podcast. It's it's a joy and an honor to be here. Um, we were talking before it began about the mutual friends we have, and, and I've wanted to meet you for a long time, so this is an honor uh, for me to be here. Very um, much likewise. Um, so I, I, I'm also a New Testament instructor. I, I teach at a, at a small seminary just outside Pittsburgh called Trinity School for Ministry. And I, I teach classes on Paul's letters and the Gospels and hermeneutics and a lot of things to do with biblical interpretation. And I've, I'm in my fifth year here now, so it's it's a good context, and I'm able to do some writing and traveling, but also I just love being with our students and, and mentoring them as well. And um, you mentioned these two books. I, I, I wrote one of them um, before I even got to graduate school. I was I was writing very much to try to explore my own thoughts. Uh, I think I think St. Augustine says somewhere that he didn't know what he thought until he saw what he wrote. And uh, I, I sort of feel like that. I, I have to I have to think by writing. And um, so this this first little book I wrote called Washed and Waiting was very much me uh, trying to come to terms with my life as a as a Christian who was also experiencing same sex desire. And um, you know I didn't quite know how to fit those things together. And so so I wrote that uh, out of out of a sense of exploration, really. So, so you're teaching uh, you, uh, five years. So you're kind of a veteran of foreign wars now. Uh, you've been <laughs> you've been in the trenches for a while, um, and you did your PhD work at Durham. Is that right? That's right. Yep. So I, I moved to the north of England and and did a master's and, and doctorate there, and worked on Paul Paul's letters and Trinitarian theology. Okay, well, uh, and uh, one day we'll have to talk about that topic. Uh, and then um, uh, and then I understand you're from Little Rock, Arkansas, and where did you do your, uh, your pre-PhD work? Yeah, so I, I grew up near Little Rock in a, a place called Conway, and I, I went to Wheaton College for my undergraduate oh, uh, degree. Oh, Wheaton grad. Okay, I'm on the Wheaton board. So we've got a, we got a whole la another layer of connections here. <laughs> yep, so I went to Wheaton as an English lit major and fell in love with Greek and switched my major to Greek and Hebrew um, and, and sort of got bit by the theology bug. There you go. He came to Jesus. That's good. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's terrific. Well, okay, so let's, let's kind of go in sequence here. You said you wrote this first book um, as you were kind of wrestling with uh, kind of who you were. And uh, let, let, me, let me start off this way, because um, you represent a category, uh, if I can say it this way, that, that some people wrestle with, and, and, and I want people to get it. So um, – uh, I, I once had a, a theologian say to me that a person shouldn't claim to be a Christian and same-sex attracted at the same time, that one mm. trumps the other. Mm. To which my reply was, uh, people who say this need all the support we can give them in the world because they mm. are being very honest and direct about a major element in their life that they've wrestled with and how Christ has helped them to deal with it. So um, so am I helping or not? <laughs> no, that's very helpful. Yeah. I mean, my, my story is, is I, I was raised in a Christian family, and like a lot of 
kids who grew up in evangelical homes, I, I asked my parents if I could pray with them to ask Jesus to be my, my Lord and Savior. And, and so that's, that's really sort of the childhood I had. And, and I didn't, I didn't have the experience of ever, you know, seriously rebelling against that. I mean, I certainly had my ups and downs, but I went through, you know, high school, never really doubting that Jesus was the center of, of, of my world. And I, I wanted him to be, I wanted to trust him and love him and know that he forgave me for my sins by dying on the cross and, and that he was God and was raised on the third day. I mean, all that was pretty core to me, um, all through my growing up years. You're Southern Baptist in your, in your roots. That's right. Yep. Yep. Grew up Southern Baptist. Yep. And, um, so, you know, my, my Christian faith was never, was never the negotiable part of, of my life. It was never in, in, in question. But what happened is as I grew older and went through puberty, um, I realized that I was not having the experience that a lot of my other friends began to describe of, of becoming attracted to the opposite sex. And, um, you know, my initial thought was maybe I'm just a late bloomer, you know, maybe, maybe this is going to, change and and you know i don't know what's going on but it doesn't feel like what my friends are describing and as i got older i realized that i was i was having a lot of romantic and sexual feelings it's just that those feelings weren't for women uh they were for men and um you know as my as my guy friends started to talk about girls that they found attractive i realized that i was finding my guy friends attractive and and i felt ashamed of that i mean i you, you know the, the culture of, of Southern Christianity can often be quite um, reluctant to talk about hard things mm-hmm. sometimes. And, and I just felt that this was something that I didn't know if anybody in my church would be able to help me. I didn't know if they'd be sympathetic. And so I decided to keep it a secret. Um, I mean, I didn't even tell my parents who loved me very much and, you know, we're good friends to this day, but I just, I was so nervous about what this meant for my life that I, I just decided to keep it a secret. And, and I remember hoping that I would get to college. You know, I knew Wheaton was a Christian college. It's the kind of place where a lot of people end up meeting their spouse. And I remember thinking if I can get to Wheaton, maybe I can start dating girls and, you know, something will click. And something will will shift, and I'll I'll be able to become heterosexual. So I'll you be went able to, to Wheaton become... with eschatological hope. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah>. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, so so that was kind of my strategy, and and um, you know I, I I think you can tell that's not a good recipe for growth. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. So so um, so so what led you then to write Washed and Waiting? Well, I, I I came to Wheaton and you know realized that my kind of hope of fixing myself, quote unquote, wasn't wasn't really working. I mean, I, I was trying to bury this part of myself and stuff it away and just hope that it would that it would uh, you know magically reorder itself, and and that wasn't working. That wasn't happening. And I, I remember through a series of circumstances coming to the conviction that if I don't find a way to talk about this with my fellow Christians, if I don't find a way to be honest before God and before, you know, at least a small group of my fellow believers, I'm not going to, I'm not going to grow. I'm not going to, I'm not going to experience, you know, wholeness and health. And so I I went to one of my professors at Wheaton. Um, It was the scariest thing I I ever did. I went to him and and said, you know, this is my reality. I have the the same sex desires and I'm, I'm scared of what they might mean. Does this disqualify me from living a Christian life? And, you know, my professor said to me, first thing he said was, God loves you. That's, that's, not, that's not negotiable. You know, you, you feel ashamed, you feel broken, but God loves you uh, as you are. And, and that was really important. Um, but the other thing he said to me was, this may not be something that God will just sort of magically shift for you. This may not be something you're healed from. Uh, all at once, um, and and we began to talk about you know what what are the testimonies of Christians? I mean, I knew that there were some homosexual people who ended up marrying someone of the opposite sex, and I wondered, you know, could that be a possible future for me? And I knew that there were more liberal Christians who talked about being for same sex marriage, and I I began to wonder, you know, could that be the right way to think about this? And and um and and where I landed was I I couldn't I couldn't see how Scripture affirmed same-sex marriage. I just, I, I couldn't make that work with the teaching of Genesis and, and Matthew 19 and Romans 1 and all these other passages. But I also knew that 
you know, I was going to counseling by that point and I was doing a lot of praying and I, I, I realized, you know, my, my same sex desire is really not shifting at all. So I think I'm going to be in this middle category of, uh, you know, holding to a traditional theology of marriage, which means I want to pursue chastity, mm -hmm. but also not having a dramatic testimony of healing. And so still being homosexual, still being gay, you know, still being same-sex attracted. Yeah, I distinguish between what I call hardwired uh, same-sex attracted people and softwired same-sex mm. attracted people as a way mm. of helping people think through what the possibilities yeah. might be. Yeah, and I think, you know, someone like Mark Yarhouse would talk about a spectrum, mm -hmm. that, that some people are all the way on one end of the spectrum in, in terms of being pretty much exclusively same-sex attracted, mm -hmm. which is my story. Mm -hmm. And then other people find themselves somewhere in the middle, you know, they're more bisexual, and, and there, there may be more possibility of shifting in fluidity. So, um, so I, 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 I wanted to try to write about that. I wanted to try to describe what that feels like. And so I wrote this little book, Washed and Waiting. And, um, you know, the, the first word in the title, washed, uh, I took that from what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, where he's describing how the Corinthians lived before they came to Christ. Uh, and he says, you know, some of you were involved in same-sex relationships. And mm -hmm. he uses two Greek words there that seem to suggest, um, you know, active and passive homosexuality. Mm -hmm. And then he says in the next verse, such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So he's picturing, you know, some of these Corinthians were involved in in, in homosexual lives, and uh, they were they were baptized. They they came into the church. They were forgiven. They were cleansed, and they have a new identity now. Their new identity is not oriented around their former pagan lives. It's now oriented around Christ. And the, and the spirit. And, and so that, that was the first word in my title, washed. And then the second word also comes from Paul, um, but it comes from Romans 8. And uh, the reason I felt drawn to that passage is because Paul describes the Christian life in Romans 8 as a life of, of groaning, mm -hmm. waiting. And he says, you know, um, as those of us who have the first fruits of the spirit, as we look forward to the resurrection of the body in the future, we're groaning, and we're, we're, we don't yet see everything we want to see. And when I read that, I thought, that's exactly where I am. You know, I haven't been miraculously changed or healed or, or transformed yet in terms of my sexuality, so I'm waiting. You know, I'm waiting for the redemption of my body. I'm waiting for the time when even my very DNA will be rewired, you know, in, in the eschaton. Um, so so that, 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 that image of being both washed, you know, cleansed and forgiven and given a new identity and, and yet still waiting, still groaning and, and, and hoping for a future that I don't yet see, that became sort of the paradigm for me to think about my sexuality. And so the subtitle here has uh, reflections on Christian faithfulness and homosexuality, and yeah. really it's about, I take it, your, your, your journey to uh, figure out how to be faithful to this tension that you found yourself in. Right. That's right. Yeah. And I tried to just describe for readers, you know, what would it feel like to find yourself in that in that place? You know, what what kind of questions would you have? And and so I spend a lot of the book talking about loneliness because I think that in our culture, you know, so much of our emphasis, even in the church, is on the nuclear family and marriage and parenting. And I think if you're choosing to live a single life, you know, a, a chaste, celibate life, you're 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 almost always having to grapple with loneliness, mm -hmm. and you're having to feel like, you know, what does it look like for me to be faithful if I'm not going to have a spouse and you know, not going to have a uh, a kind of standard heterosexual experience. And and so I just I wanted to I wanted to write in such a way that people could read that and say, oh, you know, so that's what. That's what it would feel like to find yourself in Wes's shoes. You know, that's what it would feel like to to be a same sex attracted Christian. That's the kind of question you might be facing. Now, uh, a question that pops immediately to mind is: at some point, obviously, you had to have this conversation with your parents and yeah, and pursue yeah. that. How, what, what was that like? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it was hard initially because I, you know, I, I was a quote unquote pretty good you know, straight-laced kid in high school, and, and I had already told them before I went to Wheaton that I thought God might be calling me to, to ministry. And I worried that they would that they would somehow, you know, not be able to assimilate this new reality that I was going to present them with 
with with who I who I knew I was in Christ, and so I, I was very nervous about it. And um, you know, they're, they're they're both very loving people, very godly people. But you know, as, as far as I knew when I was growing up, our family didn't have any gay friends. You know, certainly any openly gay friends, and so I just didn't know how they were going to respond. But um, you know, I sat down with them and told them and. And it took us a while. I would say it took us months to kind of work through all of their anxieties. And I think they, they dealt with a lot of guilt. You know, was there something that they did to cause me to, to be same-sex attracted? And so we had to we had to work through all those things. And I'm, I'm happy to say, you know, they know I'm doing this podcast today, and they're, they're praying for this. And so they're, they're very supportive uh, now. But, but as you'd imagine, there was a lot we had to kind of dialogue about. Yeah, and, and it's a fresh space to negotiate in many ways in terms of mutually understanding each other. That's right. Um, and and did did this happen during your college time? When did this it conversation happen? After college. After college. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I, I took a while to, uh, you know, I had a counselor one time who used the phrase, "We all need circles of appropriate transparency." Mm-hmm. And um, it took me a while to find those. You know, mm-hmm. I, I first told one of my professors, and then I met with, um, actually met with Stan Jones, who I know you've had on the, yes. the program. And uh, then I began to meet with pastors, and, and it took me a while to even feel comfortable telling my peers about this. Uh, you know, I think I think regardless of where you are on the on the spectrum, and regardless of where you are theologically, it can be very hard, and it can feel very costly to come out. You know, mm-hmm. to talk about this part of your life, and um, I guess I would want to say to your listeners that um, you know, if if you can find those trustworthy few, and it doesn't have to be a lot, but if you can find those few people who can walk with you in this and, and listen to you and sort of support you, that's that's pretty crucial. Yeah. Now it it strikes me, and we've spent a lot of time talking about this. And one of the names I didn't mention you before we went on the air was uh, was David Bennett. I've had a recent we did a recent podcast with him. He works in this area for Ravi Zacharias, yeah. and is exactly in the same kind of situation you find yourself in. And we spent a lot of time talking to him on the podcast about how does the church rally around. Uh, um, someone who's in your situation because they're just there are multiple things. There's you know there's not just the the sexuality issue. There's the whole awkwardness the church sometimes feels with single people in general. Yeah. That's uh, right. And, and so uh, you know figuring out how to incorporate people who are single into the yeah. life of the church is itself a hurdle without without having this alongside of it. Yep. No, I think that's absolutely right, and I, I've started I've started trying to answer that question kind of in three different ways. And the first way would be I think we as the church really have to find a way to rediscover what the Bible teaches about singleness. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, it was a surprise to me. It shouldn't have been, but it was a surprise to me when I began to realize that the Bible has a very very elevated view of singleness. Yeah, First Corinthians seven is pretty high. <laughs> Yeah, I grew up in singleness is kind of what you do when you when you can't get married. It's kind of a leftover option, you know, yeah. and and that's not how Paul presents it. You know, yes. and it's not how Jesus presents it. I, I mean, I was just talking with someone recently about how uh, kind of socially revolutionary it is when Jesus says in Matthew nineteen, you know, there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. In other words, there are people who are voluntarily choosing to be single. Because they're setting all their hope on on the reign of God, you know the the, the inbreaking reign of God, and that's that's pretty radical. So so I think we've got to rediscover that. Um, but secondly, I would say I think we need to really um, recognize that there are there are specific needs that single people have, and specific uh, concrete needs that same sex attracted people have to learn how to steward their sexuality. You know, I, I think we've done a good job in the church recognizing that you can't just send two people off to live a married life without giving them, you know, good tools to do that. You know, we, we offer premarital counseling and we offer all kinds of support for marriage. I think we need to recognize single people have, you know, their own needs and we need to offer, you know, pre-celibate counseling maybe, or, <laughs> or, or certainly, you know, we need to be grappling with the kind of nitty-gritty realities of, what. so what do you do with ongoing sexual desire when you're single? Mm-hmm. What do you do with temptation? What do you do with relational longing? Because none of that stuff goes away when you're single. It's still there for you to deal with, and you need to learn how to deal with it in a godly way. Um, and then the third thing I would say, I think we've, I think we've got to learn how to point um, same-sex attracted people and, and single people in general toward the fact that they, too, are called to love. 
you know, as, as I look at our culture, I think we've, we've almost exclusively used that, wo- that word love in relation to romance and, and, and erotic love and marriage. And I think we've got to get a, a kind of expanded view of love that, that everybody, regardless of marital status, is called to invest in in deep relationships, you know, deep commitments to one another, and and that's that's sort of where I've gone in recent years in some of my writing and and, and speaking. Yeah, well, this is, makes a very nice transition towards the spiritual friendship emphasis of the second book, and and um, uh, I, I just read it before we 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 uh, are recording this, and there there were just lots of levels of things that I that I saw and reflected on. Mm-hmm. Um, and in particular, I want to start off with a quote that I wrote down as I was reading that, that kind of came to my head as I was reading the middle portion of the book. Mm-hmm. And, it go, and it goes like this. It says, the opposite of love uh, or the comp- competition of love or the association of love is not about sexuality nor, thinking about opposites, hate, but loneliness, the mm-hmm. idea that I don't matter. Um, mm-hmm. and. And it seems to me that what uh, spiritual friendship is about is is making the point or b- moving towards the point of saying people matter and relationships matter, and the relationships that really matter that we don't give enough thought to are those that that aren't preset for us, like family, yeah. um, you yeah. know. Uh, you know, or marriage. I mean, marriage. You you think about entering into it. You take vows. Family. Right. There's no choice. But friends, uh, you very much choose along the way. And we're we're setting this up because we're coming up to the break here. But uh, but it seems to me that that's a, a first step. So uh, briefly, what caused you to think about writing this book? Because it's a little bit different than than the earlier book. Yeah. Well, I sort of think of them as companion books. You know, if Washington Waiting is focused on some of the suffering that's involved when we follow Christ, I also wanted to write about, you know, what are we called to positively when we follow Christ. And uh, my friend Eve Tushnet, she has this great line that she repeats whenever she speaks. She says, you can't have a vocation of no. In other words, you can't build your sense of Christian calling around what you're denying yourself. You can't just focus on the no. Mm-hmm. You've got to focus on the positive as well. What is God calling you toward? And and I began to wonder, you know, why have I spent so many years of my life focused on all that I'm saying no to, you know, like marriage and, and, and parenting and all these things. And I haven't I haven't devoted much thought at all to, to what kind of future God might be calling me toward. So that that that's that was the motivation for writing about friendship is is trying to explore what would it look like for me as a celibate man to, to find real love in the church and 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 uh, help the church community understand the role that they have you know it, it strikes me this is actually an echo of where david bennett's podcast ended up when we mm-hmm. talked through all right how does the church minister to and rally around someone who is same sex attracted but celibate and really the role of community and friendship became very very central you know i i've, I've thought for many years about that passage in mark chapter 10 where um, you know, Peter wants Jesus to focus on all that Peter has left behind. And he says, look, Lord, we've left everything to follow you. And Jesus shifts his perspective. He says, look, no one who's left, uh, you know, father and mother and brothers and sisters and, and all these things for my sake and the kingdom will fail to receive a hundredfold in this life. You know, new mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters. And, 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 and then he says, along with persecutions and in the age to come, eternal life. So he's trying to get Peter to recognize, you know, when, when we come to Christ, we're grafted into a new family. We have a new calling. We have relationships that we can pour ourselves out into. So that's really the thesis of the book is that someone like me, even though I'm voluntarily living without a spouse, And without children, that does not mean that I'm called to loneliness. That does not mean that I'm isolating myself or that God wants me to be alienated. Um, You know, I'm called to community. I'm called to friendship. And so I I stole my title. The the title of my book is is actually the title of another book written in the in the 1100s by this English monk named Aylred. Well, at least it was out of copyright. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) But Aylred, you know, he talks about uh, friendship in 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 really high terms. I mean, he says, you know, a friend is someone that you'd be willing to lay down your life for. A friend is someone that you'd be willing to unburden yourself and, and, and disclose your heart 
too. And, you know, I'm reading this in the context of a world where we use the word friend so casually. You know, we talk about friending someone on Facebook or, mm-hmm. or something like this. And Aylred is using it in a much more serious way. And to me, that was really encouraging because what that meant is that, you know, I can be a single man by choice and I can still, even even though I'm unmarried, I can still be called to the kind of love where I would actually give my life for someone and they would give their life for me and I can disclose my true self to someone. And I mean, I mean it just, it opened up my imagination. It caused me to think, um, you know, this, this, this celibate life that I'm living does not have to equal loneliness. And, the, and of course, the classic example of someone who gave their life for those around them and didn't end up being married is Jesus himself. Exactly. And, yep. uh, uh, and you know, there, were, there was the disciple whom he loved. There were clearly relationships that he had with Lazarus and others that, uh, that he pursued and that uh, represented good friendships. I, at one point in your book, you go through kind of the famous friendships that we sometimes trace in Scripture, Ruth and Naomi, David and Jonathan. Uh, you mentioned Christ and, and the disciple John and Lazarus. And, and, and then in the midst of reading that, it, uh, it struck me uh, an interesting thing because in talking about friendship, you, you sort of contrasted it to the familial category at the start. And yet, Scripture, when it addresses us in community, puts us in a family. That's right. You know, uh, we've got brothers and sisters who aren't biological brothers and sisters, but we're supposed to have a regard for them that's like the way people regard their families. That's right. That's right. Well, that, I mean, that's something, you know, as I was doing the research for this book, it's, there's something mysterious about how do we describe the closeness that we feel with a friend? Um, because sometimes a friend can actually feel closer than a brother. I mean, mm-hmm. Proverbs even says that. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So sometimes, you know, I might even say, um, if, I, if I'm feeling particularly co- close to my brother, I might say, wow, you're, you're like my best friend. Mm-hmm. What I'm recognizing when I say that is, there's a sense in which friendship can be even more meaningful than a biological kinship. That's right. But on the other hand, sometimes when I want to talk about how close a friend is to me, I might say, well, you're, you're practically my brother or That's my right. sister. <laughs> We're so terribly this, inconsistent, aren't we? There's this intermingling of, <laughs> yeah, yes. of the familial and the, and the friendly that, that I find really fascinating. Yeah, I, I, I think that's uh, very, very profound. I, you know, I have, uh, I, reading through the book, I, I think particularly of two friendships that I have. Uh, one of them goes back to someone who I've known since I was five years old, lived down the street. Wow. Uh, I, um, we're both in ministry. Um, that's great. Uh, he grew up in a Christian home. I certainly didn't. Uh, he was partially responsible for my coming to Christ. And mm-hmm. there was a time for four or five years where, where we lived – literally six houses away from each other, and we were together almost 24-7. I mean, it was yeah. – there was hardly a weekend that went by where we didn't want to spend a night at the other guy's house. And then I moved, uh, moved about five, six miles away, um, and the only way we could get together was if I rode my bike to his mm. place. And, mm. and so I would do that regularly, and we – we went to different schools, but we we held together in the friendship, and and it went through college, and you know it's proceeded on through life. Then the other close friend I have, um, I've known since second grade. Mm. Uh, actually, he teaches Old Testament at at Wheaton, he, uh, Danny Carroll, and yep. uh, we play. We went through elementary school, junior high, and high school together. Uh, went to separate colleges, but stayed in touch. I was partially responsible for for his coming to the Lord, and uh, and in the midst of that, we've stayed together. And I I think of both of them very much as family. In fact, I think of their parents almost mm. as surrogate parents for me because I was in and out of their house so much. Yeah. Um, and so you get this intermingling, and and you begin to ask yourself. Um, now that's that's community at about its highest level. Right. And the question becomes, how does the church create an environment, particularly in the midst of very busy lives that we tend to have, that tend to get in the way? I think one of the things that has kept our friendship strong is our history goes back so far, there's no right. way to, to deny that. I mean, it's just – it's we, we know each other better than we ought to. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and so – 
And, and so that drives it. And it seems to me your book is driving towards something in that direction, recognizing yeah. that isn't going to happen with everybody. No, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I don't think every one of our friendships has to be this kind of enormously deep spiritual friendship. But I think that that should be more available than it is. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I mean, I think a lot about something my friend Chris Roberts has said in his writing that um, when you think about the whole push towards same sex marriage and um, what the motivation is behind that, he says, you know, most of us in the modern world, we can't imagine living without marriage because our capacity to belong to one another in more chaste ways is so limited. Hmm. In other words, we have such an impoverished imagination when it comes to how we belong together, how we, how we forge deep relationships, that some of the only ways we can imagine doing that is, is with romance and marriage and sex. And, um, you know, I, I mean, I, I was even watching a, a, a silly sitcom recently, and the, and the, and the, the comedian was, was making a joke about the fact that he wants this deep relationship with this other man. But he doesn't know how to get it, so maybe he should just sleep with him. And, you know, everyone laughs, and, and you know, you chuckle, but you think, wow, there's something poignant about that. Mm -hmm. Because what he's saying is that our culture has sort of lost a vocabulary and, and, a, and a mechanism for, for pursuing closeness with someone of the same sex without somehow immediately jumping to, you know, sexual innuendos or, or, or the category of, of gay to, to mock it, you know, mm -hmm. or to, or to, um, uh, to make light of it. And, and so I, I, I think we're living in a, in a, in a time when friendship is, is kind of ambiguous. You know, I, I mean, so many of us love our friends, so many of us want friendship, but we don't know how to speak about that. And we don't know how to pursue that. And some of the social structures that have supported that in the past have, have become weakened. I mean, you mentioned our busyness. I would also mention, our mobility. I mean, mm -hmm. we're so much more mobile than than a lot of our previous generations were, and and it makes it hard to forge these kind of deep friendships like you're talking about when we're so committed to always being on the move. Well, you know? and in fact, but, you know, one of the impediments potentially, at least to the friendship I described initially, is as I move further and further away from my friend, my ability to stay in contact with them. That's right. Altered. And what's interesting, what's fascinating to me is, is that in a you know in the, all in older forms of life, there was much, much less mobility. And you did, you know, some people's lives never ranged very far and wide at all. I remember a story of um, you'll you'll get it, you'll enjoy this having lived in the UK. We lived in a little village outside of Aberdeen called Torfins. It had about eight hundred people in it. Yeah. And one of our closest friends in this little village, his father, had spent one night out of his seventy five years in all his life outside of his home. Isn't every, that amazing? Every other night, and it was by accident. He got fogged <laughs> in in Edinburgh, and so he yeah. couldn't get back home. <laughs> and so, you know, and he was describing this to us, and we were going, that's a foreign world. Absolutely. You know, I, that, is, that is so much lack of no mobility. Yeah. I mean, I can't even imagine what that would be like. Yeah. And, so, and so we – so you're right. We've got this mobility, but on the other hand – we have opportunities with friendships to do things that were in some ways not possible in terms of communicating despite right. our mobility. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and, and you know, I, it grieves me that I live so far away from some of my dearest friends, but but one of the things that our, our world has made possible is, you know, I, I make it a priority to go and visit them. And you know the, the 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 technology we have makes it possible for me to do that in a in a short amount of time. I can fly down to Florida and and you know spend a week with them uh, rather than have to you know take several days to get there. And so so I don't want to I don't want to say that all of you know the modern technological advances have been detrimental to friendship, but I do think we probably have more of a commitment to autonomy than than ever before, certainly in the Western world. And I think that works against our form, forming the kind of friendships you're talking about and I'm trying to talk about in the church. You know, when, it, when everybody is so committed to, you know, setting their own timetable and their own 
schedule and even where they live, uh, you know, that, that, that's a force that I think is in tension with, with, with this kind of deep spiritual. Well, the spiritual static idea. of all the choices that we have of what we can do with our time, which certainly right. is much more multiple than it used to be. Right. I mean, I, you know, I, I imagine, again, I'm thinking back to earlier times, I imagine times, you know, when, it, when the day went dark. It was dark, you know. Right. <laughs> I mean, right. you might take right. a candle or an oil lamp or something, but that's going to be pretty limited. That's uh, right. That's and, right. And, and so there are just these sociological factors that that come in, and so in some ways it demands that you have to work harder at friendship today. That's right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot about the fact that the the, the research I've read from sociologists would suggest that some of the best. Um, glue for friendship, some of the best cement that will draw friends together is regular, unplanned interactions. Hmm. And I think about how hard it is in my life to have regular, unplanned interactions. I mean, when I see my friends, it's almost always because we've said, hey, our lives are so busy, why don't we plan to have dinner next Tuesday? And, you know, it's it's not regular, it's something we carve out time for. Right. And you know, that, that, that makes it harder to form a kind of relationship where you're just sort of falling into conversation. You're not, you're not um, necessarily working off of an agenda. You're simply, you know, spending time together and deepening the relationship. And, and I confess, I don't, I don't exactly know what to do about that. I mean, I, I suggest in the book, you know, some practices we might begin to think about to, to work toward becoming better friends with each other. But, but I, think, I think there are a lot of, as you say, socio- sociological and cultural forces that are working against us here. Yeah, I, you know, I, when I think about friendship, I kind of think about them in three categories. There's mm. there's the friends that you have because of the context you find yourself living in. So that's the p- friendships you develop because of your work, the networking that that provides, or the church that you're a part of, that kind of thing. And that can come and go, and the real test of that is when you move. You right. know, how many of those people do you continue to have contact with? You might have been seeing them every day at one point in your life. Now, you know, you might stumble across them now and again, and some of those people you never hear from again. Not yeah. that you have lacked the interest of staying in touch with them, but just the right. pull of life. Right. As, uh, They're kind of seasonal friends. Exactly yeah. right. Then, of course, the, the family connections, which is kind of a – can be a mix and match, as we all know, because some of those are comfortable for us and some of them aren't. Uh, yeah. But – but they're there, and they're they're kind of an odd kind of given, you know, in yeah. some ways. Um, and then there's this third category of the of the thick and thin, you know, the person who, for one reason or another, because of the way your relationship is overlapped and the diligence with which really both of you pursue it. I mean, it, yeah. it, in many ways, it takes two to make it work. Um, right. Uh, you end up – it doesn't matter how far away you are from one another, whatever, you stay in touch. Right, right. No, I think you're exactly right. And I, I mean, I read one book that kind of memorably said um, there are just friends. You know, there's a friend you might meet once a month to watch a football game together. You're just friends. Then there are rust friends. Those are the friends where the friendship is so old and so creaky that it's got <laughs> rust all over it, and uh-huh. you can pick right back up where you left off. And then there are must friends. You know, this is the friend that when something huge in your life, something life altering happens, they're the one you must call first. You know, they're the one that you can absolutely rely on and and trust yourself to. And I, you know, th- distinguishing those different levels can be helpful because yeah. it, it. I think it. I think it rem- is a reminder that. You know, not everybody has to be in that must category. Not everybody has to be in that in that I'm going to keep in touch with them through thick and thin category. And we can rejoice when we find, you know, one or two or three. I think Abraham Lincoln said, consider yourself lucky if you have two of those kind of friends your whole life long, you know. Yeah. And that doesn't mean we have to devalue uh, the friends that we just have for that season or that we have, you know, more casually. But I think I think we need to recognize we all have – different needs, and, and, and many of us really need and are hungry for those deeper kind of friendships. And those other friendships really can come in and plug holes at certain points. I mean, uh, you know, right. I think about the person who's on the other end of marriage who ends up being a widow or a widower, and to have yeah. other people who they 
can connect with in that season of life is important. You mentioned at one point when you're talking about the different ways in which friendship can be pursued, that we're really not just talking about singleness and and being married here. There are cases of couples who, yeah. when one couple doesn't have a set of children and another couple does, the potential of what that relationship can mean to the childless couple can be significant. That's right. That's right. Yep. And I think, you know, particularly for to sort of bring this conversation back to the issue of same sex attraction, Mm -hmm. I think particularly people in my shoes, uh, we're often not lacking in in community. You know, many of us are part of churches and we know that we have people that we can share meals with and, and do things with. But we do sometimes feel like we're lacking that deeper level where, you know, I can go and, and, and really disclose the heart of who I am to you. And sometimes it just feels like if you're not married, where do you find that level of, of commitment? And so, so part of what I'm trying to do in my book is to say, let's provide the kind of care for same-sex attracted Christians that would, that would actually make sure they, they have people in their lives that they can truly be utterly themselves with. You know, they can, as, as Aylward would put it, they can disclose the secrets of their heart to someone. Hmm. And um, I don't think that has to be only found in marriage. I think you can also find that in friendship. In fact, in some cases, I think the great irony is, is that sometimes uh, marriages need that other kind of relationship. So it's the wife who says there's something here I can't really yep. engage with my husband, but I've got this close friend, and maybe yep. she can help me through it and understand it, or vice versa. You know, yep. this is something only the guys can talk about, that kind of thing. I think that's exactly right. I mean, one of the most meaningful things in my life was I, I, I have a, a very close male friend, and his wife, early on in our friendship, came to me and said, you know, Wes, I know that my husband needs you, (laughs) and I know that I can't be everything to him, and I just want you to know that I am honored that you're his friend, and I want you to be his friend. And I have to tell you, I mean, that was so reassuring to me, and it was so um, consoling to me. You know, I, I I think you're exactly right. Yeah. So it, it it leads us into okay. So how do we how do we kind of get in this direction? And towards the end of your book, you do uh, discuss um, possible ways of doing this. I mean, first is just sensing the need for this kind of friendship, allowing this category to exist, if I can right. say it that way. Yeah. Yeah. And your second suggestion is to start small. Let's take them in pairs. Um, so um, you know, the need for friendship and starting small. What do you have in mind there? I think when I think about the need, I, I would love to. I would love for the church to be a place where someone could say, you know, this this is the shape of my life right now. You know, I'm a single man. I'm a same sex attracted man. This is what I feel like I'm needing from my community, um, and and to have to go into real you know concrete honesty there, and then you know with the starting small, I think sometimes I have a tendency to romanticize friendship and think, wow, I've got to go off in quest for a friend. And what I do when I do that is I sometimes overlook the people who are already right here, you know, right. The right, quest for right. the holy friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And 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 so I, I think sometimes pursuing spiritual friendship can look like you know maybe mending a fence with a friend who who you've known for ten years already, or or, or maybe just reinitiating with a friend that you've fallen out of touch with. Uh, the, the the next two are interesting. I mean, you do make the point that there are multiple layers of friendships that, and I think this is true. We connect with different people for different reasons in different ways, yeah. and they fill uh, different needs in that relationship, and so that deepens them. And then the other one that you have is um, uh, the idea of, of of serving in such a way that serving together sometimes can strengthen those relationships and can yeah. can build those bonds. Yeah. I mean, C.S. Lewis talks about the first condition of of finding friends is wanting something other than friends. In other words, if you're engaged in a in a in a in a goal, you know, if you're serving, if you're if you're pursuing a hobby or a or a or a service project, you're actually more likely to find real friends than someone who's just sitting at home saying, wow, I really want friends. I need friends. I crave friends because it's actually the thing that you're both pursuing that will allow you to become you know, close with one another. Yeah. Now, the last two are um, the that sometimes friendships are built through the doorways of hospitality, where people are extend in yeah. in a good way 
uh, there's space to you. You mentioned one example where a couple was going on a vacation and they extended the hand of including you That's in it right. in a way that was almost surprising and yeah. and really spoke to you. And then, uh, and then, of course, the next and last category is working hard to stay connected. So uh, yeah. two other important elements. Absolutely. I mean, some of the ways that my friendships have flourished is when is when people who – you know, when I look at their lives, I think, well, they don't necessarily need friendships, but they've, they've, they've admitted their need. You know, married couples have said, Wes, we need you as much as you need us, and we're going to fold you into the life of our family. And that's been very meaningful to me. And then the final point is I just talk about what can we do to push back on this culture of autonomy and selfishness and mobility that we have? You know, how can we actually choose to stay rooted more? I mean, could we imagine actually turning down that better paying job halfway around the world because we say, you know what, this this community that I'm, a, that I'm a part of, this church that I'm a part of, this friendship that I'm a part of is worth staying put for. Um, and I don't, I don't think everybody's called to that, but I think that should be a question that more of us are thinking through. Well, Wes, this has been an absolutely delightful conversation to work through to talk about um, both your experience in the church and how it's led you to contemplate uh, community and friendship in a fresh kind of way. I think it's a significant topic. It's very under-discussed, if there is such a word. And, uh, um, and, and so I really appreciate your willingness to take the time with us to discuss um, these topics with us. Well, Daryl, it's been a joy, and I'm honored that you asked me, and I look forward to meeting you in person someday. Well, we'll for sure do that, and we look forward to um, having you back sometime as, as issues come up. And we thank you all for joining us on the table, and we hope you'll be with us again soon. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth, love well.